food service director. The, the school yeah. nutrition services director is a position that exists in the SAU budget, and therefore it's apportioned uh, out as part of the SAU apportionment. Um, the, the challenge with that is that uh, the individual food service budgets in the three districts don't include the cost for that food service director. So in essence, the food service programs look more healthy than they actually are because the school nutrition services director is not apportioned. Um, there were, so the SAU budget committee recommended... Adam, what do you mean not apportioned? It well, it's not distributed to the three food service funds. It just comes... You know, Mont Vernon pays their SAU apportionment and included in that is a cost for the food service director, but the food service fund isn't making that contribution, the general fund is, yeah. which is coming from taxes. And so the SAU budget committee recommended that instead, in each of the three districts, there's an, a, a, a budget transfer that occurs that allows for that to come from the food service fund if funds are available to more accurately reflect the true cost of the school nutrition services budget. So if, if now, Hegan is profitable and Amherst and Mount Vernon are not. Do they wind up paying the majority of that? Or how does that work? No. The, the cost of the food service director is still apportioned according to the apportionment formula. And so the amount that's attributed to Mount Vernon, if you have that amount in your food service budget, you'll cover that. If you don't, the general fund has to cover it anyway. Okay. And we're going to make that change for the current fiscal year. So the current fiscal year will reflect that. Why is that change significant? I don't understand what the problem was that that's fixing. Um, because the food service funds in each of the three schools are showing uh, a stronger fiscal position than, they're actu than they actually should be. So if, if a food service fund is showing a profit in one of the three districts, when in fact they've not accounted for the, the school nutrition services director, the net effect of that is that taxpayers are paying more in taxes and the food service uh, program as a self-funded program should be paying that. So essentially, the net, the net effect is it might lower taxes a little bit in each of the three districts. And what happens to the profit that's currently uh, assigned to the various districts? It, um, it rolls over. It stays inside that fund. Because it takes so much federal funds, you're, you're not allowed to give that back to taxpayers at the end of the fiscal year. So our all three of our food service funds are carrying modest surpluses that have accumulated over time. Um, and in theory, is that money used to buy equipment? And to actually improve or increase the level of services that they provide? Yes, or to cover years where there are losses, which there have been some. And I don't know off the top of my head which how each program is doing in each of the three schools. Um, but Now, technically, each of the three constituent school districts could choose to handle this in a different way because this does not change the SAU budget and it does not change the apportionment formula. It changes how each individual school district accounts for their portion of the SAU budget that's attributed to the School Nutrition Services Director. Um, so I guess hearing these questions, we can bring it back to future board meetings at each of the three boards, and you can make your decisions there. But this this was one of the only, this was actually the more significant recommendation of the SAU Budget Committee. So the SAU budget is now down by the amount of that salary? No. no. It's still in there. The SAU budget doesn't change. It still gets apportioned the exact same way. It's just what in your case, the Mont Vernon School District's budget would do. Um, it, it's simply a journal entry. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, any more questions on that before I continue? Uh, so the final budget is $2,338,227. That's an increase of 3.5%. 3.4% of that increase has to do with health insurance, uh, as we discussed last month. Uh, that's not only the, the insurance rate increases, but also we had some employees uh, choose to begin taking health insurance for the first time. That accounted for a lot of that. Overall, salaries are down $13,000. Legal's up fourteen, dollars and everything else is, is, is up a total of $1,000. Um, so the apportionment increase is not uh, proportional um, because the apportionment formula is based half on, um, on students in attendance and half on valuation. Uh, so Amherst had an increase in attendance uh, and, and students enrolled, and so therefore Amherst takes a bigger brunt of the SAU apportionment formula. So Amherst is up about 87000 Mont Vernon up about 5000 and so Hegan actually decreases about $5,000 as a result. Um, so the things that we need to do tonight is we've already opened the public hearing. Um, after your questions are completed, you need to hear from the public. Uh, take a motion to close the public hearing. 
and then a motion to adopt whatever budget you choose to adopt at the at the conclusion of that process. Well, questions? I have a question. Yes, sir. <clears throat> How uh, the SAU has entered into contracts on behalf of the three districts. In particular, they've entered into the transportation five-year transportation bus contract. Why is that not an SAU level expense when the districts themselves have not are not parties to those contracts directly? Uh, good question, Mr. Glover. So uh, the SAU, um, in the case of bus transportation contracts, negotiated those contracts on behalf of the three constituent school districts, and those contracts were adopted uh, at the SAU level, and then um, in turn by the three constituent school districts. There's debate. Uh, about whether um, the SAU is a party to those contracts or whether each of the three constituent school districts is a party to that contract. The significance there, I think where Mr. Glover might be headed, is the significance there would be if the SAU has obligated the three constituent school districts to a contract, does then that contract become a legal requirement of the three constituent school districts and ergo must the increases in the contracts be included in the default budget calculation of each of those three constituent school districts. Is that the heart of that's, your? That's, the, that's where I'm going, yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, so the, the, the short answer is I don't know. Um, and because the default budget law changed and changed drastically and changed with legislative testimony that uh, made it clear that the intent was to artificially lower default budgets as low as possible, um, it is likely that a lawsuit or lawsuits will occur after this budget cycle continues and um, some lucky municipalities will need to defend their default budget calculation and probably litigate these exact same types of questions. Does that answer your question? No. <laughs> <laughs> is it answerable? I don't know if it's because it's no answer. Here, here, here's where I come count on this. I've read the, the changes in the law, and this all t hinges on this redefinition of what a contract is. Okay, but there's there's another counterweight to that, which is, I mean, you can have a contract for some service that's not legally required. Okay, but, but there's legal requirements to provide special education. There's legal requirements to provide transportation, and in my view, the, the obligation we, we, we see it in our in our respective default budgets. Default budgets go up because our legal responsibilities go up. And so, you know, just because we have also a contract in play doesn't mean that our obligations um, under the law uh, are different. So, in my view, um, the, legal, the legal obligations outside of, of avoiding a breach of contract vis-a-vis -vis your statutorily required to provide transportation services trumps the, the, the fact that you have some kind of contract to provide those services. And, and, and here we have a situation which is a little bit unique. With, I, I'm harping on the transportation because it's an expensive line item. And, um, and the SAU, in its collective wisdom four years ago, adopt, you know, accepted the bid and the Amber School District didn't accept that bid. And we're apportioned a, a portion of that bill, right, vis-a-vis -vis the SAU. But that's not reflected in this SAU budget, and it has never been. So my, my, my question is, how, how do we address, given the new law, is there, is, there, is there a reason now that we should be addressing that in the SAU budget, which, as far as I understand, once we adopt this budget, it become also, in and of itself, becomes a legal obligation on the, on the incumbent districts. So there's like a double legal obligation here. A, to provide transportation services, and B, to respect the adopted uh, SAU budget. One other interesting fact in New Hampshire is that multi-year contracts are required to have a non-appropriations clause included in them that specifically says if there is not an appropriation, sufficient to fulfill the contract that the contract can be null and void meaning in the case that we don't have funds that that we could no longer have to be bound by that contract that we signed 
-hmm. That's a requirement of contracts not approved by voters directly. So multi-year leases, as an example, you cannot do a multi-year lease to buy a set of portables in your operating budget unless it has a non-appropriations clause in it, meaning that if the budget doesn't pass and you're stuck with a default, that you don't have to no longer pay that lease and you're not bound by that contract. So that's another, what I would call, aggravating factor in that, in that discussion. So the, the, to cut to the chase, um, <coughs> the, it's, it's up to each individual board to determine whether they are willing to fight that fight and potentially be one of the uh, guinea pigs that helps to hammer out that kind of um, issue. Oh, that's a question. Wouldn't the risk of that, though, of having that non appropriation clause is that if we end up at default, we don't have the money to pay the extra, they could back out? I mean, because really the entire contract, so let's say it's with our current bus company, they can say, well, you're not going to pay us what we agreed to. We're actually not going to bus your kids in. Yeah. Is that the risk? Or um, the risk is, is more likely to be, because they've amortized buses, they, they want to be in, in contract with us and to continue that. They're not looking for a way to get out of the um, contract with us, I don't think. We can check with their emissary at the end of the table there. But, um, the, um, uh, what, what's more likely is that we'd have to renegotiate or, or reduce services. Because uh, what the only thing legally required in New Hampshire is to provide bus transportation for students in grades one through eight who live more than two miles from the school. Mm -hmm. We're not required to provide for kindergarten, high school students, or kids who live within a two mile radius of the school. So um, there would have to be some, there could be some decision by a board that if our default budget becomes our budget, that there's a, 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 a need to reduce services to, to stay within the budget and guidelines. Other questions or comments for Adam? <coughs> on the budget or on the busing? On the budget, uh, probably. Okay. Take yep. your pick. <clears throat> so just uh, in, in terms of the salary line item on the, uh, the page, we, we talked about this at our last meeting. What's the game plan right now for the business administrator and, and the uh, director of operations? What's the game plan? Yep. Uh, the game plan is to stay within what's budgeted. Um, we have, uh, we've had the, it's part of my, going to be part of my superintendent's report. We've had um, several candidates interview for the business administrator position, um, none that I'm ready to bring forward uh, quite yet to the SAU board for consideration. Um, we have had one candidate come back for a second interview that we're still in process with, um, but we're still accepting applications and, and waiting to see. So essentially what we're doing is waiting to see the quality of the candidates we have and if, and if they have the skill set to be the full business administrator position that existed prior. Um, if not, then we'll hire someone similar um, to what we had uh, most recently where there's a director of, of uh, budget and finance and then still have a director of operations position um, that's part-time and uh, fulfills that other half of that job. But my plan in either scenario is to stay within budgetary amounts that we have. So if I understand you correctly, if you hire a new business administrator that's got all the skills and qualifications to actually function as a full-fledged business uh, administrator, the director of operations position, Correct. Other questions for Adam? I have one. Yep. The, <clears throat> this, this is just educational, I think. <clears throat> so the FY20 proposed as it's apportioned to the districts, does that apportionment, is that, the, is that part of the default it is. calculation? It's a legal requirement. Oh, right. So. Okay. That's why it's so defeated. So, I know it's a complicated issue, the default, but if, if let's say that um, we hired a superintendent on a two-year contract and, 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 and that included raises in the second year, mm -hmm. and those are raises are, or for any staff in the, in the SAU office, would those be part of the proposed and then get sucked into our defaults? Yes. Right. So, why not other things that well, the SAU enters into? Visa. I mean, I, I, I keep, the bus contract. By the way, is just one example. It's a top-level example in my mind. But but all of this, even these other things, which are much lower dollars, they're getting sucked into our default budgets, and yet this bus contract is not. So why not? 
Mm -hmm. uh, because the SEU budget is only allowed to have certain things in it outside of specific voter approval. For example, if the SAU wanted to hire, um, make up a position, a, uh, uh, I don't know, help me out here, you know, help. A um, holiday coordinator. Yes, yes, a director of holidays. Um, because, because, or communications, or communications yeah. person, oh, yeah. thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. The statute indicates what positions are allowed in the, in the SAU budget um, without authorization, and then any position beyond that, like a communications director, would have to be approved by more than half of the districts representing at least half of the students within the SAU itself. And on what ballot would that appear? On all of the respective districts' the ballots? On all three constituent school district ballots would have to be a, a war article saying you vote to approve in the SAU budget the addition of a communications director totaling this amount of money, and then it would have to pass in at least, and the way it works in this SAU, it would have to pass in at least two school districts, and those two school districts would have to represent more than half of the students in the SAU. So it would, so... But, so it would appear on the Mont Vernon ballot and the Amherst School District ballot, but not the Sohegan ballot because that's double counting, right? No, it would be on the Sohegan as well. Also? All three. Uh, I don't know how you separate the, uh, the votes at that point. But okay. Votes by student. It's how many students are in each respective school district. Hmm. Hmm. How does the district contract for things like, but how, how, if the SAU goes out and gets a long-term contract for transportation or any, anything else, how, how do we, how do we under the new law going forward, forget about what the quagmire, quagmire we're in now, how, how do we, will we put something like a, like a transport, a five-year deal for whatever service uh, on a, on a, on a warrant in all three uh, respective ballots in the future? For, in a similar way, and then if 50% of the combined approves, then we're good to go, or or not? That would be a novel approach. I, I, it's probably more akin to a, a holding company like Berkshire Hathaway. If Berkshire Hathaway negotiates a health care plan for all of their companies that are that they own, then they're doing it on behalf of those companies, right? So each of those companies then have a, an individual relationship with that health insurance provider, but it's, it was negotiated on their behalf by the the, the top level company, and that's. I think that's more akin to how it works, is the SAU negotiates transportation contracts on behalf of all three, but each of the three really have an independent relationship with the provider. I mean, in all reality, if the Sauhegan School District really did not want to use the same bus company, there's nothing that would prevent them from having an independent contract with a different bus company. It would be much less cost effective, it would be a, a logistical nightmare, but that doesn't mean it's prohibited. Right. It's still possible. Right. And uh, I'm not sure this is the forum for this, but I'm just going to throw it out there. Um, if, say we had no bus contract, and we're all just floundering for bus service, <clears throat> of course it makes economic sense for us to pool our resources and have an economy of scale. But barring that, if we just had to get a bid and accept it and provide the minimal, at least the minimally required bus, not the extra, not yeah. for the high school, not for the kindergarten. <coughs> Whatever that bid was, we'd have to. That would that would go into our into our default budgets, would it not? It would have to because it's a legal obligation. We have to provide those services. Just like if we have reason to believe that there's some special education needs that are more than what was approved last year, we put that in our default budget. That's why our default budget can be a lot higher than what was approved in a prior year. It's debatable what you would do in the case where you did not have a bus contract for the legally required service of providing transportation for kids grades one through eight um, two miles from the school. However, it's it's clear that the intent of the legislature was to artificially lower your default budget calculation as much as possible. So it's so where your where your chain of thought is going makes sense to me, but the legislature I think was intentionally trying to do something that was not logical because their intent was let's not have any default budgets that are higher than our proposed budgets. We don't like that. Yet the language expressly says, the new language says they recognize that the defaults could be higher than proposed budgets. <laughs> How ironic is that? Here's my whole, this is why I'm going off on this, guys. If this new law if we can't at least provide the minimum services, then whatever uh, 
proposals, whatever vision we're trying to implement in a default situation, we're just going backwards. And I think that really jeopardizes the investments that, that we've made. It jeopardizes the return on the investment, everything we're doing with pace, everything we're doing with curriculum. If we have to pay $100,000 more here for busing and then $100,000 more here for something else, then all of a sudden we're cutting programs, we're cutting services, we're, we're having huge class sizes. There's other things we're going to have to peel away from to meet the outstanding legal obligations. And I'm fighting like hell to try to find a way to get these legal obligations in our default budgets you know, so that we're, so the bus goes, no pun intended, goes forward instead of goes backwards. And, and I'm just really frustrated with the ambiguity in the law, trying to find creative ways to uh, make a case, to make a solid argument. Um, I don't know what our, our SAU attorney wrote a public, uh, wrote a memorandum to some law conference. And one of the impetuses, not only maybe to, for this, change was to lower the default budgets, but it stems from a case from Weir, where, it's, where a board of selectmen uh, between elections entered into a contract, and they got challenged, and uh, there was, it was like $60,000, and the plaintiff won because the voters hadn't approved that contract. Now, I don't know what that contract was, but I'm, I'm thinking that there's not a legally required obligation. And so what Gordon surmises in his memo is that um, is that um, uh, that's what the law was trying to prevent. So from us to hire an auditor between elections and say, yeah, well, we're in a contract now, but that hasn't been approved by voters, so that makes sense to me. But this, all this nonsense about uh, hobbling us in our default budgets that we can't provide what we have to provide really frustrates me and I think it jeopardizes everything that we're trying to do strategically, agency for students, uh, competency-based learning, uh, class size appropriateness, uh, emo social emotional learning, all of that is at risk if we have to pull from it to pay uh, to, 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 to not breach a bus contract. So two possible remedies that I'm aware of. One is to ditch SB2 and go back to school district meeting, no default budget in school district meeting. Um, but there's also no voting on election day. It's essentially a superpowered deliberative session right, where the budget is set that night. And second is, and the much more feasible, is to lobby your local legislators to fix the law. So for next year, for this year, we just have to do really well. So we have to chew our, chew our fingernails off and mm -hmm. pray, to, pray to whatever. <clears throat> yeah, we have to do a really good job of explaining. Okay, I just wanted to get that out in the air. thousand dollars. Have you ever given any thought to increase that? That would be a wise thing to investigate, yeah. Yep. The thousand dollars is not competitive. It's not at all. Um, and then uh, <coughs> computer upgrades, just buying new laptops and stuff. Actually, we have, uh, we happen to have the Director of Technology in the house. <laughs> Mr. Shakran, would you like to weigh in on that? <laughs> uh, the line item for computer uh, increases and so forth for the SAU, we buy new laptops, new... We replace five or so every year. Okay. Is it the age of the ones you're replacing? Um, How many did we replace last year? Can we get a list like we've gotten in the schools for all the computers and the ages?
other questions? No, I mean, the way I would handle that is it, with the board's blessing is I would approach all of my employees and say, do you have other options for health insurance? And what's the number it takes for you to jump on your spouse's health insurance? Mm -hmm. um, we're, as an SAU, we're easy. We're non-union. We can have that discussion. We can't do different things for different people. That wouldn't right. be fair. But I could certainly ask those who I know of spouses who have health insurance offered to them and find out. And then we don't need to do anything budgetarily because it would only decrease the budget. It wouldn't when, increase it. When is your open May and June. Okay. So do we need to like agree on a no, amount I, to tell you or frankly I don't think you have to do much. Okay. What I'll what I'll do is is sounding like that's the board's consensus, I will ask my employees um, and ask them to share with me or with HR if they're not comfortable uh, what the number is and see if there's a number that makes sense. Okay. Twelve thousand dollars, that's not gonna make sense, but if it's reasonable number that I can just come back and report to you and let you know we'll make that change for future SAU health insurance buyouts and then we'll just move forward and as a result we'll save money. I promise that was my last time, sorry. <laughs> so let me take a look at the offering for health insurance. Is it a hot deductible plan? Is it a Cadillac kind of plan? What are we looking at? We have a the same plans that all of the schools have, all the school employees have. Okay. It's a driver-based system where the um, the middle of the road plan is the driver. We pay a fixed dollar amount for that plan. If the employee chooses a more expensive plan, they pay the difference. If they choose a less expensive plan, then they they still they end up paying less of a percentage. But it's a driver-based plan. So and, yeah, I'm not familiar with the Amherst contract, so you'd have to help me here. But let's say Amherst negotiates with their teachers about more contributions towards the health care costs. Are the folks at the SAU sort of following the same path? They're actually following they? they're actually following the Sohegan teachers, which are pay more. So I think we paid 25%. We, we pay more than the Amherst teachers do, but, le but less than the Mount Vernon teachers. I, and we're right, I think we're some even as. Any more questions? If not, I'm yeah, gonna. I have oh, one. Yep. <clears throat> is, is, is this proposed budget the maximum amount that can be put into a SAU budget? No. Is, is, is there, is, the question is, is there money that the districts have in their proposed budgets that could be represented in this budget? And it isn't for some reason because it's always done, been done that way or because uh, nobody's thought of it, why there may be a justification to put an expense in the SAU budget as a, and then apportion it to the districts as opposed to putting it in the districts in the first instance. I don't know the legal answer to that question. I know the ethical answer is that the SAU budget reflects every multi-district SAU budget that I've been in. I've been in three. Um, and it has this in, in each of the three Hudson and Litchfield before they split Pelham, Pelham and Wyndham before they split uh, It's not me um, <laughs> Interesting. Um, um, all three have, have exactly similar things as what's in this this is a huge budget I, and I think if we looked around the state, I think that it, that would be probably close to universal so I don't know that safe it's a safe budget if I say if I read mm -hmm. ethical, ethical budget, this is probably well, what an SEU budget's intended to be. Questions? <clears throat> Steve. Absent any comments from the public in the public hearing, I would move to close the public hearing. So I was going to ask if there were <laughs> um, any comments from the public? No? Okay. So I'll second Steve's motion then. Okay. Close the public hearing. All those in favor? Okay. 
Um, so we would need a motion to actually approve the budget. Is there a motion? Steve. I'll move to adopt the budget as proposed. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Terry. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Okay. Motion passes. Thank you. All right, and now we actually have a public input for the board meeting. Anyone from the public who would like to address the board? No? Okay. And um, next, before we do the superintendent's report, I'm just gonna have the individual boards um, give their report. So I'll start with Amherst, Galen. Um, first, I just wanted to introduce, we have Bob Hins over here. Um, he was chosen to fill the vacant spot left by Kevin Shea for the rest of the um, rest of the year, at least until the um, election in Amherst. So welcome, Bob. Um, and then, I mean, really just the update, we're working on our budget. We met with our Ways and Means um, last week, so we still have got a fair amount of work to do to prepare for the public hearing and the deliberative, so we're working on our budget. Thank you. Uh, next up, so Higgins, Jim. Yep. Um, we met this week. I guess the biggest thing is um, we met this week to vote on the Sohegan budget, and um, the outcome of that was probably not not as anticipated as it going into the meeting. Um, we actually came out of the meeting voting to further reduce the budget and so the budget that we're going to present to the public is actually seventy three thousand dollars less than what was approved by the advisory finance committee so um, that's the budget that we're, we're proposing that will be on the, the Warren article in March um, I think that uh, in the vote the vote was um, six to one we have that meeting with one loan to center um, I think we actually came to a to a good place where most everybody agrees, so I'm, I'm fairly happy about that, and hopefully everybody else is as well. And then the only other thing that I wanted to um, mention was that it's that time of year when kids are getting their college acceptances, and um, we're going to be hearing many of these over the course of, of, of the year. And I think there was one special one. Um, I don't want to get her name wrong. Was it Ariel? Oh, it's, yeah. Um, um, Ariel. Ariel, yeah, the yeah, one special one, our Ariel Zlotnick um, was um, received her commission to the, the United States Military Academy at West Point, which is a very rare honor. So um, I wanted to, I know she's been all over the internet and all over Facebook and everything like that, all, Nashville Telegraph, but um, it's such a rare honor to be appointed to something like that that I wanted to make sure everybody on the board knew that as well. So we're all very proud of her and I wanted to make sure we recognize that. Thank you, Jim. Just a question with the, the budget. What was the main sticking point? Um, yeah, no, I mean it's all public record, so um, we we basically had a, had a working session to go through the budget. Adam um, had brought the budget proposal to the group. Um, there, part of part of um, part of the assessment was an assessment of the master schedule. Um, so, in other words, the all of the classes that Salhegan puts together to offer it to, to all the students. And as part of that assessment, one of our board members um, had calculated that there was probably a good, um, at least in this board member's mind, there was, in their analysis of the master schedule, there was an opportunity to reduce staff by 5.5 as part of the discussion. Um, Adam was bringing us a budget that looked to reduce staff by two. And so as part of that overall discussion, um, we landed on reducing staff by three. So Adam, again, Adam, we went into the meeting looking at reducing staff by two, and we left the meeting by reducing staff by three. So that, that brought the budget to um, a reduction of 73000 over the previous fiscal year, if that makes sense more years until we start to see the kids um, excel into high school to see things. 
think we're going to start seeing a, 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 a slowdown or a, a ceasing of the decline in enrollment closer for another another eight years. I think it's like 2025, right? So 2026? Four to five. Four to five years, yeah. So we've got... A little ways to go. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to pose a challenge. It's a good question. It's going to pose a challenge because, you know, as I think I've said this at a previous meeting when we talked about consolidation, we're going to be trying to swap the engines out on the airplane at 40,000 feet by implementing all the changes in the school system we want to change, upgrading the facilities at a time when enrollment is decreasing at Sauhegan, but also potentially increasing over at AMS. So um, it's going to be a, we're going to be, we're going to have to get innovative. We're going to have to get innovative in terms of how we handle that. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Tom? Uh, like the other two boards, we spent the majority of our meeting uh, going through our budget and our presentation for the, the public hearing. The way, you know, our budget is up some, um, really as a result of that increase in, in student enrollment that you'll eventually see, and, and um, we're trying to fill out the classroom teachers to two per class per grade level. We also have uh, some demand in the special ed area, which we're trying to address as well. Thank you. All right, uh, moving on to superintendent's report, Adam. Thank you very much. A uh, number of things. Uh, first, I already mentioned the business administrator hiring process. I'll skip over that. Um, each of you had a cookbook in front of you. Um, that cookbook was put together by our school nutrition services director. It is recipes from around the SAU, and it includes artwork from our students um, inside of it. So uh, very good recipes that have been shared as a Christmas gift from our John Lash, our School Nutrition Services Director, to each of you. So. Are these uh, how to make a really good school lunch? Perhaps. These are some recipes we use, yes. Yeah. Are they all in, you know, enough to make for 100 or so? Or <laughs> <laughs> They're only batched for 150, so yeah. I'm, I'm going to do some serious dividing to get where you need to go. But, uh, really nice of John to do that. Okay. Super nice. Yeah. Um, Tell him thank you. Yes. Uh, my evaluation, um, so you folks, I want to make sure the board is aware of how that process works with my evaluation. Um, in your contract with me, um, every year on November 1st, my contract is automatically renewed for another year if you do nothing. Um, so you've signed a two-year contract with me, so this past November 1st didn't matter. But next November 1st does. Um, if you want to be done with me, you must tell me by November 1st, otherwise you're stuck with me another year. So it makes sense for the evaluation process for me to commence in probably in October of every year. So I want to get you guys on that cycle moving forward. Something I do internally is I send out a survey, I send it out for the first time to all of the faculty staff within the um, SAU and allow them to give me feedback on my performance. Um, I received a number of responses um, and I've shared all of those with Amy tonight. Um, I'm going to let her review them and then decide whether to share them with all of you, but it's my intent that, um, that everyone sees them. I thought about making them publicly available, but frankly, there's a number of comments that are sensitive about how we do things within the schools, and while I prefer to have um, everything public, I think it's best not to. And there was one comment that I had to redact even from Amy because it had nothing to do with me. It had something to do with somebody else. Um, so, but everything else is, is unfiltered and available. I just want to make sure you folks know as you do my evaluation that you've been asked to complete in Janu by January that you think of the timeline moving forward for that. Uh, next, school start time update. Um, first sequence of events. Uh, last winter there was a committee headed by Terry <coughs> Dean that looked at reviewing options for school start times and uh, there was a school survey, a uh, community survey in the spring um, talking about swapping start and end times of our schools, making elementary start first, I'm sorry, yeah, start first, and then middle and high school start after our elementary schools. We got that community feedback. There was, there was significant support for it, but also there was some, a, a significant number of people as well that didn't support that idea. Um, we hired a transportation consultant who um, had been told somewhere along the line, not by me or Porter, that our high school and middle school could not get out after 3 p.m. And so I think that artificially limited his um, analysis for us. And he suggested that all we could do is shift all of our start times back by about half an hour. 
And so we looked into that, we investigated that, uh, and we held a community forum about it just about a month ago. Um, and uh, what we found at the community forum and what we've discovered as conclusions thus far is that research supports a shift to our secondary schedules. Um, there's significant data, significant research, and I think it's pretty well established that most people in our towns now feel as if moving the middle school and high school schedules back is the right thing to do. However, that change can come at the expense of our elementary student schedules. That's become very apparent and clear. And moving elementary even further, even later, seems to be a non-starter. Some people support it, but more people who are working people would really struggle with a 9 to 3.30 schedule for elementary students because you probably need coverage both in the morning and in the afternoon. And elementary school students are up earlier, and so they are probably not as awake and as alert and later in the day. We heard that a lot. We also looked at a single bell time, having everybody on the same schedule. That's not fiscally uh, possible. It is logistically possible, but fiscally it would add $310,000 at least for our budgets, and that seems to not make sense. And so I am back to the, the swap of schedules being the best solution. Not the easiest, but probably the best. Um, so here's my recommendation. I'm recommending that the SAU board in January not this month, but at the next meeting, adopt and commit to shifting school start end times effective September of 2020. So not this fall, not this coming school year, but the school year after that. Um, I would like to move more quickly than that. However, there's significant things that have to be done to make this go well. Here are some of the planning guidelines that I think need to be in place while we plan this shift. First, elementary school can't start any earlier than eight. 8 a.m. is a starting time, ensures that kids aren't in the dark at bus stops almost ever, even with our really short days. Um, so I think that's as early as we can go as 8 a.m. AMS and Sohegan, we need to get as close to 3.30 as possible for their end time. Any later than that makes it difficult, more difficult, and probably um, too difficult for sports activities, school jobs, etc. cetera. Um, we need to impact reduce our impact to student athletes as much as possible, either by shifting athletic schedules, which by the way, those get set a year ahead of time, so having a year to plan those out is significant and is helpful for this process. But shifting athletic schedules where possible, um, and also investigating rotating schedules for our middle and high school so that the same class isn't at the end of the day every day. May not be possible to do anything, but having a year to plan that is definitely necessary. Um, limiting the impact of Sohegan and AMS after school clubs and activities as much as possible, including investigating having a period be available before school for those things now that the school day has been shifted later. That may require uh, the opportunity for an early bus as opposed to a late bus uh, to be available to, to, to students. Um, we need time to, uh, to expand and investigate the expansion of before or after care options for parents, uh, more than what we have now. And finally, keeping elementary students in the daylight has to be a design requirement for that. So what I'm suggesting for a timeline is that you folks mull this over over the next month and in, the, in January, uh, commit to that fall 2020 change. I don't want there to be any, I don't know what just happened. Um, it's still on the screen there. But. There we go. I don't want there to be still debate about whether we make the change after January. I want the debates to be about the best way to make this change happen, okay? Because we've heard significant feedback from the community. We've, we've done a good job hearing from people, gathering feedback, gathering input. Um, and uh, in fact, earlier today, I participated in an online video conference with, this, with a group of uh, very concerned citizens and got, gathered some of their feedback as well. So we've done a good job. We've done survey. Um, we've had a public forum. We've heard from people online. I think we need to do another survey once we have a plan formulated to get final feedback. But I want us to be committed to where we go. From January to October, have a committee that hammers out all of the details, all of these things. That way, in, in, in October and November of 2019, that committee can report back to the SAU board. And if there's any changes that require budget changes, they can be adopted into the, the budgets for fiscal year 21. So that's what I suggest for a time. Question. That was a very fast synopsis of <coughs> months and months of work. I understand that. Brevity may not be our friend right now. I'll go into any more detail if you'd like. But. 
Definitely my, a question. my question is moving a moving to the idea of a period in the morning for the middle and high school for activities, isn't that counterproductive to why we want to start school later? Yeah, it is. Um, but not every kid participates every day. And, and frankly, um, what's very important, uh, an important part of Sohegan High School is that there is protected time outside of athletics for kids who participate in clubs and activities. There would be no way to have that protected time if school got out at 3.30 or 3.45 in the afternoon. It just wouldn't, it just wouldn't be feasible. So in order for us to still have that protected time, it would have to be something that's done in the morning. But the high school is also looking at alternative schedules over these next few years as well, and who knows what might come up at work. This is assuming that the schedule is roughly the same as it is today, which it may not be forever. Okay. So just to piggyback on that answer, it also, like right now they're starting at 725. I think that even if there were an early period, it would be more like 8 o'clock. So you're still giving them some extra time. And it would only be, again, sometimes, like maybe it's once a week, you come in and you meet with a specific teacher and they, they have that scheduled time that they're going to be available and be there early. And, or community council, I would love to meet in the morning instead of the afternoon. That would make my life easier. <laughs> um, so, you know, there are some things that it could actually work quite nicely. Um, and we could maybe have more community support because that's the same thing we were looking at as having games later, you could have more parents who can attend them without having to jeopardize their jobs. And so this might be another way that we can have parents available to have community members available at a time that they can still go work a full-time job as well. So I think that there's some real um, unexpected benefits we could get from that. John. <clears throat> Can you remind us what the research-based recommended start time is for different age groups? Well, there's lots of research that has similar conclusions, but um, it seems to be around 8.30, plus or minus half an hour, and Terry might be able to help me out, between 8 and 9 is a suggested start time. No sooner than 8.30. Is no sooner than 8.30 um, for adolescents. <coughs> What is the stress to start for younger? It does not exist. No right. for younger oh, what is the definition of an adolescent? Yeah. Teenager? Eighth grade? Seventh grade? Sixth grade? Seventh and up? I think it's usually 13. 13? Yeah. It's more of an age thing than a grade thing, right? It's, it's, yeah, it's, it's unique to each individual student. Right? Of course. <laughs> Is literally when they well, we're ag it's aggregated. I understand. Yeah. Oh, okay. <coughs> There's one weekend where it seems like your children are up at 5 a.m. no matter what time it is or what day of the week it is, and then all of a sudden it's 10 a.m., right? And I think and that's, whenever that happens, yeah. that's when the shift occurs. <coughs> so no sooner than 8.30, and just a simple flip would be at 8.30. But we can't do a simple flip because we can't put any kids at 725. That is not our goal is to put anyone at 725. Correct. So it would be so this, much easier if that were getting, possible. This is getting logistical, but in the morning there's uh -huh. an hour between middle high school and our elementary schools for bus routes because elementary bus routes are longer because it takes elementary students longer to get on and off of the bus. So you wouldn't necessarily need a full hour in the morning if the high school and middle school are second, right? So the hope yeah. would be that elementary starts at 8, Hope will be we can get as close to 8:30 as possible, and thus as close to 3:30 as possible in the afternoon. Okay. That's where additional logistical investigation needs to take place. Is we need to actually test the routes and see how long they take. All right. Other questions? Yeah. Is there other school districts around here or in the state that are thinking about this? And also, um, <coughs> is there other schools that have already done this, whether it be here or wherever that we can learn from their mistakes and yes. uh, maybe a blueprint. Yes, we have, and we've contacted other school districts that are going through this. There's many school districts are investigating, some have implemented, and others um, have shared information with us as well. Other questions? So you're looking for us to come back in the fall, have a discussion, and um, Vote. I'm looking for you to be committed in January next month that you're on board with this as a plan and that we're moving forward and that all that has to be done is is work out the logistics 
um, have a committee between January and October, and then have final, I'm not even sure it's a vote in November, it's just a report back, here's how we worked it out, this is what we're gonna do for the following school year. So as we're thinking this over over the, the next month, um, if we have questions, who should we go to? Me. Porter's been a great help in all of this, but uh, at this point, I'm taking all of the input directly. <coughs> Is the NHIAA aware of these changes, and are they supportive of the fact that sports schedules are going to shuffle and it's going to change? Yep. Uh, the NHIAA has actually been suggesting the schools have later start times when possible, not necessarily because of school start and end times, but because of a bus driver shortage in the state and bus drivers needing to complete their daily routes before they can leave to go to away games. Um, so there's, there seems to be a movement in this direction anyway. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. Happy coincidence. Done. Just a comment as we yeah. contemplate the surveys, the feedback, <clears throat> that's informative, but in my view, not necessarily determinative um, because the research, I mean, we were here for Kids First. Is that our, our uh, surrogate? motto until we come up with something more elegant perhaps but that's the idea so if it's good for students and just because it's inconvenient for parents uh, I, I don't think that I would hate for us to, to, to make a decision that's not in the best interest of students so if this is in the best interest of students and some people are a little bit upset my hypothesis is that about six weeks after it starts, no one will even remember what the earlier <coughs> start times were, and it'll just be status quo, and it'll just be, it'll be fine. So I wouldn't put all my stock in survey <coughs> results. That's all I want to say as people contemplate this. The feedback from the public's been very helpful. It's been informative. Um, it's, it's helped shift our thinking and help us dial into what I think is a... So it's been helpful, but this is not a consensus decision. Not everyone is going to love this change, no doubt about it. Gary. I would just have to say about that, I think that we're committed to the why, and it's it's absolutely important, but I think that we have to be sensitive to the how, because it does affect families, and we've really appreciated that we don't know everything, and we can't think of every place where there could be pain points, and so it's been really helpful to hear from people and say, well, have you thought about this, have you thought about that, and it's like, oh, we need to make sure we address that, and we'd rather have it on the list early and find a way to minimize those pain points and make this as smooth as possible for everyone because while there will be some who is going to be more painful than others, I get it, but it's still been really helpful because we don't know everything and so <coughs> it's been great to get that input. Uh, and who's first? Oh. <laughs> Howard, go ahead. Uh, to what you were saying, Terry, there are quite a few bus drivers that actually have students that go to Milford trying for Amherst or Auburn, and they have stated that if this change happens, they have no recourse but to quit driving the bus. So the impact will be that you will lose drivers. And in a time when we're, we're at a loss of drivers, so that's another thing. Milford's also looking at their schedules, and I, I'm, I'm hoping that Milford's also looking at their schedules, and so I'm hoping that if we declare a commitment to this, it may help them in committing as well. So I can't speak for their board, obviously, but I do know that this is also on their agenda as something they're considering, and that will hopefully help that. Hopefully they can do it at the same time. Yeah, that would be lovely, wouldn't it? That's when they're planning on making the change, same time as this. Jim. Um, when all of AMS started uh, at 8.30, the later start time? The later start time. Other questions? All right, we have some homework to do before next month. All right, my last item for <coughs> an update, thank you, is um, I get to it here my system. Uh, <laughs> 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 assistant to the superintendent. Um, so, a strategic planning update. Uh, we have uh, visited every single faculty over the past month or so to let them know where we're at as an SAU with broad level overview of where, where we're going as, a, as, a, as, a, as an SAU. Um, this chart in particular has been what we've talked about and the building blocks for where we're going and building our strategic plan. I've been over this with you as an SAU board a couple
couple of times. Um, where I think our next step is, is that we need help um, operationalizing this plan and getting to the next level with it. Um, partly because we haven't had a business administrator for the last few months, but partly because the expertise uh, doesn't exist within the SAU, including with myself, um, I think that we need some help. And so over the past um, month, we've looked at uh, what we can do to have a consultant to help us with our strategic plan. Um, I, I really believe that while this board and the SAU in the past has done this, a lot of work around strategic planning, I think there's still a need to engage stakeholder groups in the process right now. Um, and so that work would be lost without some help doing that. Um, our portrait of a graduate work that has been done um, has been tremendous, but needs to be finalized and adopted as well as a, as a direction um, for our group, starting with the end in mind sort of thing. And then the implementation plan to operational, operationalize our vision, we need help with that. Um, and so I've been looking to consultants to help us with that. Um, we had two firms reach out to us and, uh, and or us, we've contacted, we've been in contact with two firms. Um, I received and reviewed proposals from both. Um, one uh, person who proposed subsequently withdrew their proposal. Um, and I'm recommending that we hire a group called Battelle for Kids. Um, I have copies of their proposal uh, that we can pass out. Like. Um, and I've asked uh, two board members, the chair, uh, Chair Facey, and also Jim Manning because of his work on strategic planning, um, to review some of this material and make sure that we are on the, on the right track. Um, I believe our deliberative sessions are a key moment in our annual cycle where our voters are the most engaged with our schools that they will ever be for the year. We've seen that happen time and time again, where a deliberative session is a time where there's the most scrutiny on our schools and it's our biggest opportunity to present where we're going and what we're doing as a school system. And so I think there's a need to be ready for deliberative session and to have some of this work be done. So I've worked with Patel for Kids to come up with a timeline that will help us with that. So this timeline, I know it's small on the screen, but January 16th would be their first on-site session with us, um, where they would meet with my leadership team and plan and coordinate our roles, responsibilities, and what we're gonna do to get through this process. Um, January 30th would be a community session where we have residents and staff engage in the process and begin their work um, in the strategic planning process. What that does is that sets us up for our deliberative sessions to have some of this work be in process. We should have our portrait of a graduate updated and ready to go, and we should have directions uh, by deliberative sessions. And then you can see their plan is to be done and out of here by June. So this is not a, an outfit that's looking to stick around and hang around and add more cost. They're looking to come in, spend six months with us, and then by June have you as an SAU board adopt the finished product um, for us. Um, it is uh, $41,000. That they're, that's what the fee is. Um, originally, they had proposed $59,000, and we negotiated down to 41 with, I think, not removing anything that we need um, from the process. So I'm very comfortable with the number. I can tell you I've checked some of their references um, <coughs> and where they're working, and I'm pretty excited about this, uh, this organization. I've also asked Jim and Amy to contact some board member references on our behalf. Um, to hear from other board members and other places where they've worked um, to see if they're any good and if they're worth their medal. So um, I apologize for springing this on you uh, at the last moment and not even being on the agenda, but uh, given uh, my conversations with, with many of you, I felt like it was important to push um, in this way. So first question you'll probably ask, do we have the money? The answer is yes. The SAU budget is doing well this year, partly because we haven't had a business administrator for three months. Um, so that helps uh, cover the cost for these services. Um, so yes, we have the funds, and I think this is an appropriate use and a, uh, a valuable use of our services. So I'd ask Jim or Amy who have had a little bit more time than you folks have had um, to weigh in. Go ahead, Jim. All right. Um, so today I spoke to Matt McClellan. He is the former president of the Upper Arlington Schools in Columbus, Ohio. Um, he's also the president of Miles McKellen Construction Company in Columbus. So, um, great guy. Um, 
we talked for maybe about 15, 20 minutes. And he, um, he wasn't part of the strategic planning process in terms of developing the plan, but he felt he was unique to give some insight because he became a board member when the strategic plan for Upper Arlington had been finalized. And then he left four years later after their strategic plan had been fully implemented. So he gave me that perspective. And what he said was that um, he really liked what this group did because the plan that they developed was outcomes oriented, which we've been talking about for a while. I know other people in town have been talking about that. And it allowed the board to get the entire school district into alignment. And so um, over the course of the four years, because there was alignment and because they had a template for quarterly updates that went back out to the, the community, so the community understood what was going on, because they were outcomes oriented and because it got everybody into alignment, they were really very efficient in terms of being able to accomplish everything they wanted to accomplish in the strategic plan. So um, he wholeheartedly, wholeheartedly recommended them. And um, after talking to him, um, I felt really good about their experience because mostly because of that, that alignment piece. So if you think about all the things that we're doing right now or trying to do as a school district, um, school system rather than SAU, we really, we could really benefit from that alignment. And um, so I, I'm, I'm very much in favor of this. Yeah, I am as well. I unfortunately I played phone tag um, with a, a reference. However, I was able to read through two other reports that um, that Patel for Kids has had completed. Um, I was impressed. We've been working hard to try to get this accomplished for a while. Um, and I'm frankly really excited to have a definitive plan and have a group that's going to be able to bring us across the finish line. Um, we've done a lot of work. There's a lot of pieces out there. I think partly probably why this, the, there's a reduction in the fee is because of all the work we did with Vision of a Graduate. This board has engaged in a lot of work. Um, we're already doing a lot of things that are going to be encompassed in this, um, especially around mastery-based learning. But we need to have we need to pull this together, and I'm frankly really excited to to, to start this. Um, and I, I also was impressed that one of their first comments was engaging the community, which I think is something that is challenging for us to do as a body on our own. And I think it will be really helpful to have um, have a group help lead that work to engage community members, all stakeholders, staff, um, administrators, and be able to come up with the best the best uh, product possible. So, if there's uh, questions or comments, I'm sure um, you can answer. Yes, Peter. Um, thought, sorry. It's okay. Um, <laughs> so. Are there measurable objectives that at the end of this process that we can say that it was a success at the end? Uh, is it the strategic plan? Is it what, what would be the measurable outcome? Obviously, not having a chance to, to have looked at it, uh, but you know, I've engaged in a lot of consultants and sometimes it gets soft on the, uh, yeah. the deliverable end. And then the other question I would have is. Are the people local, and what percentage would be travel as opposed to contact with the community if they're coming out of Ohio? Well, the guy from Ohio was was on a board that worked with the group. Yeah, I'm looking at the address. They're from Ohio. They are from Ohio, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, when I when I met with them, I said, um, what matters to me more than anything else is that we end up with a nice plan at the end that is not just a nice plan at the end. Meaning, it's got to be something that has a blueprint for how we move forward specifically over our next several years as a school system. I, we do not need more flowery language about what we believe in and what we think about schools. We need a plan for what we're actually going to do to move where we want to move as one of the top school systems in the state. So I told them, I need board references that we can call that will prove to us that your work produces plans that result in results. Um, and that's what they were able to provide to our board members. So I feel strong. It's going to be a document. That's what it's go going to be. Okay. Um, but that document has got to be something that has community buy-in where we feel like, 
okay, now we know what we're doing. That's a deliverable. Second, um, we are, there's another um, SAU in the state that's already using them. Some of the dates we picked match up with some of their travel dates to that other district. I told them, find dates, we'll work around your schedule to save money. That was part of how I negotiated a lower cost. Okay. So is there a percentage of travel versus I didn't ask. Okay. I'd be curious to know about it. Yeah, and Bob, just to um, fill you in a little bit, we had a previous strategic plan that really did not give us measurable outcomes. So it, it is absolutely a, a goal or, a, I mean, a, a, a definite to have measurable outcomes where we can we have key performance indicators that are tied to, um, to what we're operationalizing. Okay, I guess then the follow-up question, if I may, is that are they are payments tied to some of those measurable outcomes, or is it pay them up front and we get what we get? It? No, no, we'll, we'll, oh, okay, we'll, so we'll, yeah, we'll okay. have a contract with them where we pay after. We, we, every vendor we have, we don't pay until we get the product. Or unlike, is our credit so good because we're we're never going anywhere? We can tell vendors that we don't pay until we get the items. Period. And so in this case, we won't be until we get the results. Can you speak to some of the results that? They achieve with some of the other districts. Any, any examples of things that would relate to what where we want to go? I guess because and I'll say that because we were through the last plan, we had professionals. We put a lot of time and effort into it, and it was for nothing. And it's yeah. not the first time, right? So yeah. why is this time any different? Just because we're hiring and paying for something? You know, we we paid the last guys. We so, did. So yeah. How, are we going to know when we get the right thing? And and. So I guess can you speak to the results. Um, yeah, that's, that's a good that's a good question. Uh, so a couple of things in response to your uh, your question. One is I've seen three different strategic plans for three different school districts. They all look different. Um, the thing I liked about that was it showed that that they they work with the existing district and try to produce something that that district is looking for. I mean, they were all very, very different. Um, the, the Actually, the, uh, ironically, the Upper Arlington strategic plan, I felt was light on, you know, key performance indicators, like actual numbers, which is something I thought. But I've seen other strategic plans that they've done where there, where there have been that. So I think it's, you know, we're going we're gonna to get out of it what we put into it. And then the other, the other piece to it is, is, Tom, is that, you know, what is our other option at this point? You know, so we had, we had a guy come in, I don't know how many years ago now, and I remember after he was into it for a month, I went into Peter's office and said, this is not the guy. This, or maybe it was probably longer than that. I'm actually kicking myself for not doing it earlier, actually, but I remember saying to him, going to his office and saying, this guy, this is not, we're not going down the, the, the right path. This is not the right path, and you know, I was a new school board member, so I, I kind of kick myself now over it. Um, and then we try to do stuff on our own, right? Um, none of us have the capacity to lead an initiative like this. The biggest thing that was missing last year, when I was starting to get things moving, when Peter was still in place, was that we the, the community engagement. You know, we needed somebody to really do the community engagement piece, which is actually a fairly heavy lift to make sure that the community is on board, the board of selectmen are on board. The, you know, we don't we don't have that. So we're at a point now where we've got this mountain of information. I think we're all pretty comfortable where we want to go. We've got this mountain of information. We've got to take this out into the community. We've got to get some head nods. We've got to get some buy-in from different constituencies within the community, and then we've got to package it together and then turn it into something that we can that that Adam can operationalize that we can follow over the next however many years this thing turns out to be. The one question mark I do have about this group, but I think I'm, I personally am going to have it with every single consultant that comes in here and pitches one of these strat strat strategic plans to us, is that a strategic plan is not a strategy, like I've been saying from the very beginning. And so one of the things, the two of the things that I'm going to want from the group, and I'm going to press them, because they're going to have their own process, but I'm going to press them super hard on this, is one, we want outcomes like we want to be able to measure success based on what we're driving to and then secondly we don't just want a strategic plan 
we want a strategy. And when you have a strategy, what you're talking about is competitive advantage, where you, where you decide things that you're not going to do. And I, I think having talked to this board member, this Matt McClellan, that he was completely on board with that. He understood it because he runs his own company. And he said, if that's what you guys drive to, they will, they'll understand that and they'll accommodate because they've worked with enough schools that have had that type of request. So that's my, that's my response. I, that's, that's, that's where I, where I think we're at with this. What's the other school in New Hampshire that's doing this? Milford. 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 Oh, they're close. Does that make sense? Other questions, comments? Yeah. So all that work that we've been doing over the last couple of years, at least, many years longer than that, sounds like. Yeah. But it got, was rekindled. Uh, I mean, you did at least two pretty significant. Uh, Christine, we had the, the we did the board writing. Christine yep. and I had a couple field trips. Okay, okay. So I mean, so we <laughs> have a data. right. Yep. And they're it's it's relatively it current, and they're going to take it all. Yep. Um, yep. Will we benefit from seeing what data we give them? Could we? I, mean, I haven't seen the data. I haven't seen any of the outputs from any of the inputs yet. It hasn't come back around That's in why months. We need them. That's why we. This is exactly why we yeah, need them. I mean, Who's going to do that work? Right. Like. What? What? I mean. So no, I, so we just have raw data that hasn't been crunched by anybody. Just like bleh, here's here's the here are the big uh, marker sheets from the boards that we did. Is that the kind of raw data that that we're going to be giving them? Um, no. We've synthesized. No. I, I mean our our. our, our um, you know, PowerPoint slides from a couple of board meetings. Is that the, what is our raw data? What are we What are we going to be handing to them? It's a lot of that. It's, yeah. it's all of it. It's all the yeah. discussions from the past several years right. that have to be synthesized. But the, again, the two pieces missing are community engagement. That's not happened lately, and the operational outputs of that of all of that work. There's a lot of information and a lot of work that's been done. Yes. It's right. Just that's needs to come together with the SAU's um, participation, full participation, and the board's participation, and engaging the community. So, and th and that just takes someone doing it. And frankly, the SAU doesn't have the capacity as a board. That's difficult for us. You know, I can't lead that work personally. Jim can't either. Um, a professional to do that work. And I mean, like, I'm just, no one's read this except maybe you guys. Um, are there, will they, I don't know, a month, will they be, will there be a representative or uh, some kind of update every month going yes. forward if we hire them? Like, here's where we are, here's what we've done, here's what it looks like, here's, the, here's what's going to happen in the next month. Will, yeah, it'll I'm be part of our agenda going they're, forward? They're coming to our board meeting, hopefully, to, yes. to engage with us. So yes, absolutely. Yeah, they will definitely need to engage this body. Yeah. The, the group that they meet with in Milford is 69 people. So they are thorough in, in involving selectmen, former board members, you know, school board members, community members, et cetera. It, it's, it's not a select group. It's, they seem to cast a wider net. That's good. Go ahead, Terry, and then Jim. So, all right, I hate talking to the mic, but I will. At my church, we knew that we needed a capital campaign. We had some big projects that could not be covered by just, you know, normal maintenance. And we had let it go too long. And we said, if we want to be successful, how do we do it? So we did a whole lot of talking internally. And then we found somebody who it is their gig that they go help set up successful capital campaigns. We did the work. But they guided us so that we would have a successful campaign. And it's, it's gone really, really well so far. I think that you can prepare, you can be ready, but this isn't what we do every day. All of us have other jobs. And we try to be as informed as we can. We try to do everything we can. But for something large and wide scoping, I mean, I don't have a lot of patience. I know it's hard to tell. But I really don't. And spinning my wheels and talking about it for three years and getting nowhere is just no thank you. That's not why I, I joined. And so anything that moves us forward and helps us do it in a way 
that is as responsible and that can get results. Like we know where we want to go, that we've all agreed, but how do we get there? And if this will get us there, because I have so much faith in the people who want to do this, but just that extra little bit of expertise, I think, um, from somebody who's vetted and has proof of results, I'm, I'm all for that. Is I'm with you, get us over the finish line. We know, we can see it, we can see where we want to go, but we need to know how to get there. All I was going to say is um, the, the big, the, one of the biggest reasons why we need this is because we, the, the critical piece that we weren't able to get to, the capacity constraining piece, was getting out to the community, getting, getting that community engagement, getting that teacher level engagement, getting that parental level engagement, getting the taxpayer level, level engagement. That is absolutely critical. It should really happen up front. We didn't have the capacity to do it up front. And like Adam said, the, the, one of the first things they're going to do is they're going to come in and they're going to set up a, 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 a working committee, a, a multi-stakeholder committee, and be able to manage them, run with that, manage that entire process. That is not something that anybody at this, as far as I know, anybody at this table or anybody at the SAU office has the capacity or wherewithal to do. That's one of the really the biggest things. Everything else is just like, it's like the Hoover Dam. You know, everything else is like the Hoover Dam. You know, all the work we've done is the water behind the Hoover Dam. It's just pressing against the dam. You know, we just need a group to just open the channel up at the bottom and let the water start coming out the other side to relieve some of the pressure. And um, that's what I think this group will be able to give us. What are you looking at me like that for? <laughs> it's just been a long day, man. <laughs> just Steve, go ahead. Questions. Yep. When did we recognize that we needed outside help, and then why are we getting this in December to start in January? Four years ago. <laughs> Four years ago. But that was never discussed here when I've been here, that we needed outside help. Yeah, I, honestly, I think um, we've been in a period of transition um, and tried to get this done with the, the previous administration weren't able to do it, Adam came on, and uh, frankly, we needed to give him some time to acclimate, um, and landed here. So this group, was it brought to our attention last week, last month, Ms. Milford was doing it, or were we looking I'm, at I'm it? not quite sure yeah, what so your the motivation tell. is. Yeah, so the, the question. solicitation of requests for proposals, and yeah. you know, all that stuff. when did that all start? So um, actually there wasn't a solicitation. I was approached by a group in town um, and we've, we've had discussions about this um, with four chairs um, about, hey, how are we gonna get this done? Because it's, it's just too much for this board. We haven't been able to get it accomplished. It's frankly too much for the SAU to do within, um, to do in house. I think, I think Adam was hoping that he would be able to get it done in house, but frankly, there just isn't the time um, to do that. So it, it, it has been an ongoing discussion <coughs> at four chairs, and it was precipitated by um, a group coming to, uh, to us and us thinking, yeah, this is probably the best way to go. Um, the four chairs had a conversation about it and were to talk to their respective boards about the possibility. Um, and I, I, I'm sure that the four chairs or the three chairs did that. And then um, Adam became aware of this other group that was having some success locally. So the um, previous group decided to back out and we would have been discussing two groups, but we're discussing one. Did you have a follow-up question? Yeah. Yeah. Just on the cost, is it a fixed fee? Yes. And it's outcome driven? Yes. It's not hours based? No. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Just one more question. Yeah, sure. Is there any way, is, is there, are we exposed to the full 41K or is there a place at which we can decide, hey, this isn't working? 
we haven't negotiated what the contract will look like for them, but I always make sure that we have incremental opportunities to back out. If they come in and we would just say hey, this is yep. never going to happen. <clears throat> if we put this out to bid with other groups, it is going to cost us a considerably greater amount of money. A considerably greater amount of money. The, the, other, the other group that approached us in doing this, um, they were outcomes driven. I, I, you know, my concern was um, I really felt like they could only commit to February. And that seemed to move around depending on when you talk to them. Um, I feel like they can only commit to February, and that's not that's not enough time. In my view, that's not enough time to really get our arms wrapped around this. And then to, to Steve's point, well, the only other comment I'll make is that you might be right. You might be right that we did not talk about it in this SAU body about needing outside help. But I can tell you that I had asked the previous. I had, I had been asking and pushing the other the previous administration to say. We need outside help for at least four years, at least, which is probably why I'm a little frustrated at this point. But you hide it well, Jim. Do I? <laughs> <laughs> can't, you can't do what we want to do and, and not get outside help. You can't. Not in my, not in my view. Uh, it, um, so we have our raw data, whatever that is, whatever form that is, and then we'll be collecting new data um, to, to fill in our gaps, to pick up where we left off. I mean, for example, we had, you know, the Southwest model, right, blah, 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 blah. Now we have to fill in the blanks, kind of like a Mad Lib, right? So. We, <laughs> And we have. Is that what you're reducing that to, John? Well, <laughs> in the spirit of brevity, but I mean, it took a lot of wherewithal to bring the example of Southwest to us in the first instance. Uh, and the model of what goes here, what goes here, the whole notion of what, what isn't included is, as being so important. Like, we didn't have any of that before you brought it to us. <clears throat> so it became a little bit of fill in the blank which I was getting excited about. And we had a bunch of words, and we had, we had everything. And it was time, I felt, we haven't seen this in a while, but it was time to pepper, time to put some words in there and then and to round that out. Um, uh, so what, what can we expect as a community, whether we're on bo board members or we're, we're parents or teachers or whomever, whomever, what kind of questions are they going to ask us going forward to, to, to fill in the blanks and to, and to put four corners on some kind of document that we can actually pull triggers on and ask for money for uh, and direct resources towards and or away from, you know, what, 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 what what is their process? I mean, maybe it's outlined in here. I just read the first page, and it's just a lot of, oh, you know, it's a lot of puffery in the first page. So what, what's their process as far as you've been able to discern at this point? What can we expect to hear from them? When I get a, an email from them, hey, give me your top 10 of what, Jim McClough, is that what I'm going to get as a board member or as a, as a parent or as a community member? Or I'm going to see a Facebook survey or maybe something in the mail or, I mean, I, what, <laughs> what, well, what, 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 what is? What it's is? going to be what we design and what we ask them to do. But largely, it's going to be their large group meetings where they pull stakeholders together to work through and wrestle through the future directions. And then working with a core team that I have, my so, not all of my administrative team, but a select few that I pick to work on this effort to help make decisions where there's gaps. Okay. I like where we ended up, by the way. It just got stalled. Maybe that's part of the problem why we, we need don't some have help. Capacity. Right. We don't have capacity to do the work. I mean, it, you know, you, and I don't want to belay this, this conversation, yeah. but you walk into any company, make, you know, at least in my experience, you walk into any company and they talk strategy, but they don't do it. They do operational effectiveness, right? Why do they do operational effectiveness? Because that's where they make their money by selling widgets or whatever, 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 what have you. Strategy is always considered fluff. Right? So 
It's true, it's, true, it's true in the school system. The school system, you have gears that have to operate on a daily basis to make the school system work. Adam has no capacity to take on this type of thing. Christine has no capacity to take on this type of thing. You think about hiring another person in the SAU to take on this type of work. There's nobody in the community that's going to want to invest $100,000 in another administrator at the SAU office, right? So it, it's just we, so I don't, I, what I would expect is they're going to take the bolus of information that we have, and we have a mountain of it, and they'll go through a synthesis, synthesizing process. They'll probably meet with us, you know, and other people who've been involved in it from the beginning, as well as develop this, this community, this committee of, of, of multi-stakeholders within the community. And you'll probably get subcommittees from that until they can synthesize all of this stuff and get it down on paper in terms of what direction we want to go in. We have, we've already declared, I think, over the last couple of years what direction we want to go in. We want to go personalized learning. We've said right. that. Right. I mean, that basically, in all the work we did last year, and, and quite frankly, when you talk to them, they will probably tell us at some point that the future edu of education is personalized learning. So my guess is, is that we already want to go in a direction where education is driving to anyway. So all of the stuff is there. We just need a consulting firm to come in and help us Get all, get all, put all this stuff together, and then engage the community in the process. We just don't have the capacity for that. And in my view, forty-one thousand bucks is a steal, because when I, I mean, after the work that I did last year, I started talking to some other people in the state about what I could do, and I could make a hell of a lot more than forty-one thousand dollars, which made my eyebrows go up a little bit. So I think we're actually probably getting. A steal. The other the other group was quite less expensive. But again, they they withdrew the the proposal probably because they heard that we're looking at these guys, and I could never get a sense whether we could get them beyond February, which really concerned me. I would hate to start work with a group that went to February and said, "Wait, I got something else. You know, we're doing this pro bono for you. I got you know February comes around. I got something else. I can't." Take this. Can't do this anymore. That would be a disaster. We'd be right back to where we started from. In my view. Yeah. Right. Beth, do we need to make a motion on this to spend the money? We do. Can I do that? Yes, you can. <laughs> I'd like to make a motion to accept. This Second. Okay. Any discussion? No. All those in favor? Opposed? All right. Motion carries. That concludes Great. my superintendent's Thank report. You. <laughs> <laughs> I'll go get it. Adam, Adam, um, there's some. Could you provide that slide? Your your superintendent slide deck. Yeah. <coughs> study things like the start time analysis. I mean, it's not in our packet. It's hard to you say think about it over a month, and we don't have a something to go back to. Please, yep. please, please. Thank you. Um, could you also provide just a brief update on consolidation? Uh, yeah, so the consolidation, the... Uh, not, not everybody was able to attend the meeting we had. Okay. So there was a, uh, a meeting that was held with council uh, regarding uh, the concept of consolidating between um, having the middle school become a part of the expanded co-op and the question the key question was can you would it be possible to have the fifth graders from Amherst participate in the cooperative but the fifth graders in Mount Vernon stay at the Mount Vernon Village School um, and the answer is probably yes um, it would the, the issue hinges on what the State Board of Education would decide if it's appropriate or not and so Whereas in most cooperative votes, there's a vote by the community, and then the issue is brought to the Board of Education for um, approval, or it's, uh, it's an assumed thing, and it's, it's, uh, uh, there's, there's not much risk of it not being approved. In this case, because it's probably a novel concept and the first time being done in the state, we would probably go to the Board of Education ahead of time, prior to the community vote, uh, with a fully developed plan for that purpose, I think, before it was to So, 
That's, that was a synopsis of in the timeline. Uh, not this March. Yes. Uh, in short, not this March. March 2020. Any questions? <coughs> Excellent. Okay. Um, next up, consent agenda. Is there a motion to accept the consent agenda? Move Please. to approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? Galen, any discussion? All those in favor? Great. The motion passes. All right. Um, FY18 audit presentation. See, we Wake have up. Our, our auditors <laughs> in the house. <laughs> Is there a microphone over there? Okay. It's a tough discussion to follow. Um, uh, my name is Michael Campo. I'm with Plaza and Sanderson. I believe this is the uh, see the second or third year we've been doing your audit. Um, we're passing out the audit reports now. We were a little delayed this year, um, as Adam had met, mentioned. With the uh, the BA departing, it has made it very difficult on the finance department. Um, that said, they've done a fantastic job helping us out to make sure that we get all the information we need for the report. So as you get your report, if you want to go to page 40, quickly go over fund balance. So you started the year with about $82,000 worth of unassigned fund balance, of which you put 60000 of unassigned fund balance up against the current year budget. Through a revenue surplus of roughly $300 and underspent appropriations of just short of 18000 few changes in fund balance classifications, you guys ended up with a $35,000, $35,618 fund balance. If you go back two pages to page 38, this is especially true in an SAU, what you're going to find is there's really not much deviation from your budget. You budget, you get what you expect. Um, going to page 39 is your appropriation side. Here, still with this SAU, you don't see a huge deviation from what was anticipated, although in 19, as Adam had said, with the, um, with the partial year out of the BA position, you are going to see a surplus there unless it's allocated elsewhere. Um, with that, I'm going to have you jump back. They don't design these audit reports very efficiently. I can tell you that much. I'm going to take you back to page one. Ultimately, this is why you hire us to come in. We go through all your records. We document your controls. We perform walkthroughs on those controls. We interview members of the staff. We look at invoices. We look at cash deposits. We do a lot of fun stuff that a lot of other people don't want to do. Ultimately, the reason why we do that is to be able to render an opinion. What you've received here is an unmodified opinion, which is the highest level you can receive. That means that you've complied with every GASB pronouncement required. We found no, no cir circumstances that would prevent us from rendering a clean opinion. And overall, the SAU operated very efficiently in the year under audit. Um, with that, I don't really have much more to say other than the, um, and I didn't do this the last uh, a couple weeks ago, I was in Mount Vernon. The, the staff you guys have at SEU 39 in the finance department is truly second to none in the state. Um, as Adam can attest, he's been a few, in a few different school districts. What you have here is very, very special. I mean, the fact they're able to operate without a business administrator for four districts, it really is remarkable. Um, specifically, Katie Hannon works very, very hard, is very, very bright, and uh, you're lucky to have her. Whatever you're paying her, you may want to pay her a little more. <laughs> <laughs> I, in all honesty, I, I've picked up a lot of new jobs this year where the BAs are not very strong or the finance department is not strong. That is not a concern in your district. It really is a pleasure to come over and work with your team, and uh, I commend you on having such an amazing team. So with that, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yes. I was made informed recently that um, whatever increases 
you uh, get in our contract with you for next year, if our proposed budget doesn't pass, it's going to be difficult for us. <laughs> Believe it or not, as a state auditor or as an auditor who operates solely in New Hampshire municipalities, I'm well aware of that appropriation clause. <laughs> and if we if that occurs, we'll cross that bridge when we get there. Thank and you. I also believe that our audit contract is a flat contract, if I remember correctly. <laughs> right. Thank you. Yep. Yes. So two things. Um, first, thank you for taking the time to uh, commend our staff, because I absolutely agree with you. I get to work with them weekly. And I, I don't say it often. And I mean, when I do, I mean it. But with your staff, and I think I told Adam this, you may have the best finance department in the state. And that's a pretty bold statement with no finance, no uh, business administrator. And uh, this is all I do. I do about 60 school districts and about 30 towns. So I'm pretty well versed in what's out there. What you have is special. Frankly, we have two people that could be business administrators if they wanted to be, and Katie Hannon and Sarah Jardim Lee, who's a recent hire, both of which are absolutely qualified to be business administrators, and neither of them want to be. So we're very fortunate that they are part of our finance department because they conversations I've had with each of them many times. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, can you help us talk Katie into being our business administrator? Because <laughs> we've certainly tried. No, she's amazing. Um, is there anything we could be doing? I mean, it sounds like we're doing really, really well. Is there anything great. we I, could the, possibly do the better? The thing we really noticed um, that we felt was worth mentioning, and it's in the governance letter, which if you don't have, will be shared with you. Uh, the capital asset policy, it needs, it needs some revision. It really fails to define what a true capital asset is. And then beyond that, what I would say is, it's difficult when you're dealing with an SAU. You've got three varying size school districts and the SAU. Make sure when you're dealing with something like a capital asset policy, it's appropriate for each entity. What's appropriate for Sauhegan with the newest building here uh, may not be appropriate for Mount Vernon or for Amherst. You know, for in terms of dollar amount, you know, you may say in, in Sauhegan, let's use fifty thousand dollars as our capital asset threshold for a building. Um, in Mount Vernon or or Amherst, you may say, let's drop that to 20000 It's got to be appropriate. Really what you're trying to do is capture anywhere from 85 to 95 percent of the total capital assets of the district. You get no bonus points for being at 100 percent. You want to make sure that you're capturing true data that's valuable to the financial statement. Okay. Thank you. So that would be it. And then just in general, policies, I preach this every time I come and speak, rotate them. Go through them. They shouldn't go more than five years without going in front of your board and being reviewed and adopted you as the elected body should be aware of the policies. In fact, I was just recently in a district where I had asked, do you have a fraud policy? I had the fraud policy in front of me. The staff wasn't aware it existed. So to me, if you don't know a fraud policy exists, it, it, might, not, it might as well not exist. Yeah. So in addition to the board being aware of them, reviewing them, adopting them, revising when necessary, it should be communicated to management as well. And I'm not saying you're not doing that. That's just kind of a blanket statement that I make anytime I get in front of a board. Thank you. All right. Questions? Thank you very much. No? Thank you very much. Appreciate Thank you. It. Danae, can you stick that in the minutes for the policy committee to look at the capital asset policy? In their constant rotation of policies as, as recommended. <laughs> we have a motion to accept that <coughs> audit. Uh, Galen, I can second. Yeah, Gary, this one. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Great, thank you. Okay. Um, next up, speaking of policies, mm -hmm. is the SAU policy review and adoption. And Galen is going to go over <coughs> um, the policy packet. <coughs> okay. So as I um, said in my clarification email. Uh, think over the weekend um, what we're doing right now at the policy committee is going through the policies that we believe um, we have at the district individual district level but we may or may not have adopted it at the SAU level or at least we can't find a record of whether or not they've been adopted so we're just kind of going through so this is our first batch of these policies exist at the um, individual district level but have not been adopted at the SAU level and we felt that um, that they should be adopted at the SAU level so most of the policies we'll be looking at are um, 
So most of the A policies, which those are all the administration administration concern policies, the B policies, which are around school board um, and governance around that. Um, we obviously don't have them in this packet today, but pretty much all the D policies. So those are all the um, financial policies. Um, we obviously don't need to do any of the student conduct or um, curriculum focused ones. So it'll really be the D policies and then I think a few after that. G, personnel. We have the G, personnel. personnel. Thank you. Um, so this is just our first batch. So again, we have these at the district level. Um, we just don't have a record of having adopted them at the SAU level. So we can either do a first reading and adopt next time or adopt them today. So other questions on any of them? I thought Beth had a question. Mm -hmm. My question was actually going to be, since we've already adopted them at our individual boards, can we just go ahead and... We still need to adopt it at this we board level. Well, no, but that's what I mean. Like, the do we have to go through the process that we usually do where we go through... It's up... I mean, it's we up don't to... Have to. It's, no, it's up to no. the board. We can adopt them tonight. Yeah. Or if folks feel they would like to have a uh, another month and that's fine I saw Stephen first I was just gonna make a motion to accept and adopt them second second Cool. Thank you. <laughs> well, well, I mean, well, so we've we already have to vote. Yeah. 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 We already we did that individually. The, the language is the yeah. same. Yeah. Okay. Just a point of order. This one, uh, B E D H, the heading should read S A U thirty nine instead of S A U. Okay. Okay. So we can make that we'll just double change. Check. And in fact, um, yeah, ten of eleven. Just so it's clear. In yeah. fact, what? wherever it should be, all the, the districts that across the headings as a, just a notion. I didn't even notice alphabetical yeah. order. Yeah. Amherst, Mount Vernon, Egan, and then if it's an SAU, at the SAU at the end, maybe. I'll take care of it. That's fine. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm you fine know with going that. Because yeah. if it's sure. all three, now we know. Then you it's look clear. up here and you just know. All three. Yep. And you're like, oh, this is the Sohegan policy. Do we have that policy? Is it also at the SAU policy? Right. Oh. Oh, okay, so, so was the motion to accept yeah. all policies? Mm -hmm. yes. All the policies yes. in the packet. In the packet. Yep. And there was a Go second. second yep. Okay. And there was, <laughs> was there any further discussion on that? All in favor? Excellent. All opposed? Motion passed. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, update on HB 1612, data and security in our schools. This is for Adam. Yeah, I'm going to defer um, to the assistant superintendent who's oh, done, uh, worked closely with our technology department um, on this issue. So, Christine. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so, HB uh, 1612 is a uh, um, RSA around uh, data and security in our schools. It was passed in June. Um, and uh, the big thing it calls for is a data and security plan to be um, developed and then um, adopted by uh, the school board by June 30th. So um, the tech department has been working really hard. I've been working closely with Bruce and with Greg, who is our network administrator at Sohegan. Um, to start examining our security, making um, changes around security, and there are things um, looking at our network, look, looking at our servers, looking at all of our computers, looking at really personnel and how we interact with those devices and what training we might need um, for our teachers and our staff using um, all of the devices. Um, it's a pretty big undertaking. We also have to inventory all software, which is often web-based software um, that we utilize and put together an inventory of that. We have to review privacy policies for all the software we use. Um, so this is um, a, a pretty big lift for us, um, but we're lucky that um, our um, tech department has been working, you know, since this bill was passed to start making changes, incremental changes, and um, we'll, you know, feel confident that we'll have that um, uh, to the boards. Our plan would be to share at an SAU board meeting. We plan on creating um, one um, that actually would then be adopted by each of the boards. So um, one data and security plan, since so much of it is the same or uh, nearly identical in each of our districts. Um, so uh, it would go to the SAU board in May uh, and then be on each individual board um, agenda in June for adoption. 
Um, and we were lucky Greg was able, our network administrator at Subhegan was able to attend um, the New Hampshire School Boards Association training around this RSA. So that was a really important piece. Um, and Greg, Bruce, and I are meeting monthly. Um, we each have tasks to do, come back the next month and, and regroup and um, check in on how things are going. So um, I'm working closely on the side uh, with teachers and some of their practices, and we'll have to be doing some training this summer um, with staff as well. Questions for Christine? Um, Galen? Um, I'd, I'll just say, um, when we were looking over policies mm -hmm. to bring to SAU, there is a new policy around this, I think, from September, so, mm -hmm. um, but that will be, need to be adopted at the SAU and then also at each district level, so as Christine is working mm -hmm. um, with her team, then that will come back to the policy committee to bring to you, too. Yep. Yeah. John. Um, would you add this to our monthly meeting agenda, an update? <coughs> Mm -hmm. so that yeah. we don't get something in May mm -hmm. that we're forced to choke down and approve in June and push a deadline if we have questions or comments or yeah. if we can see it happening along the way it's going to be a lot easier yeah. to, to roll into yeah. it at the end of the day yes and that way we can have input in the process as well mm -hmm. thank you yeah. I'm adding it to the Trello board right now oh thanks <laughs> <laughs> Steve oh Steve sorry so, Christine, early days yet, uh, you're working, starting, starting the work, I guess, but nowhere near finishing the work. Um, I, my initial gut reaction is I would be shocked if this data protection plan did not require additional expenditures. Uh, well, one thing we spoke about um, was actually around um, uh, that inventory for our software. We use so many different um, uh, software that I don't think there's any way we physically can compile everything that's needed in that inventory in time for June. There are actually companies, um, and Bruce has investigated uh, a few of them, that actually help you to compile. So they've actually pulled a lot of the information. They've pulled, um, you know, because uh, there's certain pieces in that inventory you need, um, you know, the, the company and the, the software, who uses it, and um, their privacy uh, plan and, and so on. Um, so. Uh, we're looking um, actually at, at that uh, right now. So Bruce is still investigating, and we probably will be looking um, to subscribe to that service to help support us with an inventory. So that's one just off the bat. We also are working on, uh, we have some pretty extensive work, and Bruce would be able to speak um, in more detail around this. Um, but with our um, uh, network, uh, there's certain pieces, too, uh, around our access points. Um, so uh, definitely. And of course, it's an unfunded mandate, so it's not like we're getting money from the state to do all of these changes. But um, right, we <laughs> but have no, the FBA money, <laughs> Let's burn it, baby. Um, but pretty significant. Um, Shocked to hear. Uh, I saw John. Uh, yeah, just 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 to recognize that some of these updates may need to be a non-public session because if the audit yeah. reveals weaknesses or whatever yeah. uh, or maybe they all should be in the first instance and non-public because I will say we're in very good shape um, compared to most other districts um, we are um, we've already done um, an audit um, uh, we consulted with uh, an outside group to actually perform a security audit to help us to then develop our safety and security plan and that audit Bruce um, contracted with a group um, probably over the summer or late spring, uh, right, uh, Adam? Um, so uh, most districts haven't even consulted with anyone yet to help them really audit and to start making changes and, and updates. They had already uh, really looked at improving our network um, with some of our access points and some of the security around that. So that work had already been planned and underway. So um, I'm pretty confident in where we are. We're actually in better shape than I originally thought that we were, um, just because this was such a big lift and every district is so worried about being able to do this. I too was pretty worried and then um, when I met with Greg and um, Bruce was um, really excited about how much work had already been done and where we are in the work. So, yeah. Great. Thank you, Christine. Mm -hmm. um, next is Special Services Bus Contract. Thank you. Um, so I'll intro that and uh, Director Dodge will have some input as well. So. Uh, we worked over the last 
year um, to resolve an issue with caring hands, and we've uh, successfully done that. So um, the contract in front of you replaces the contract that's in place. It's a new five-year contract with an option to reevaluate in 2021 for possible extension. Uh, it is about $30 per day per bus cheaper than the next closest option we came across during this process. So it is still by far the most cost-effective solution that we have. It resolves all issues that were identified in the past and um, we think is, a, is in the best interest of the school district. And so it's before you for your approval. Order, if there's anything you'd like to add or if there's any questions maybe the board has, we can jump in, but you've had a copy of the contract for a couple of weeks to review. It's been reviewed by our council, um, which the last contract had not been reviewed by council, which led to many of these issues that we had. So mm -hmm. this one's been vetted. Uh, we feel strongly uh, that we're in, we're in very good shape with it. John. So uh, I lo it looks very great. This is why we do these types of deals. Um, do we need to put this on a special warrant? No. Why? Is this going to be part of the, the SAU budget going forward, no. so it's a legal obligation? No. Or is this going to be subject, are the increases here subject to, def to being in proposed budgets or default budgets? They are. And here's the problem with putting it on a special warrant article. If the voters were to vote it down, right. then we'd be prohibited by law from spending money for this purpose. But, but that can't be that can't be a result because we're required by law to spend money for this purpose. Wrong. I mean, that's one interpretation, but you could have the other interpretation too. So here we are, you, you, back you, you to lobbying our legislature. Yes. Yes. You, you, you seem to struggle applying logic to what is a <laughs> illogical outcome and circumstance. Well, we of course we press forward course. Carrie? Uh, so I'm very glad to hear that we had this vetted this time. Um, that being said, have we made sure that both sides clearly, clearly understand what they're, because I think that that was one of the issues last time. We thought it meant one thing, they thought it meant another. They've been represented by uh, a competent counsel throughout this entire process. Okay, so this time we feel like we're all on the same page. Yes. Excellent. And, and the two people that deserve credit for this are Meg Beauchamp and Porter Dodge. They have um, spent hours sherpaing, is that a verb? This <laughs> deal through the process because it's, it's shepherding. It's shepherding? Uh, Sherpa feels like the right word. It's more like it's up, up the mountain, so yes. They've, they have <laughs> lugged this deal you know, up the mountain and they've done a tremendous job and it required uh, finesse and a and treating uh, folks with dignity, but also having a savvy business sense, and we would not be in this very favorable outcome with order for those two people. So I want to make sure I recognize them both for that. You're here. Thank you, uh, Steve. So I also want to say thank you for the effort you guys put towards this because I know it's definitely been a lot of work over the last year, year and a half. Um, my question more surrounds about some of the concerns that we had, and maybe this is an off-topic issue. I don't know, but. Um, around the issues that came out of the incident about the survivability of this company and is this going to end up costing us more in the long run should something happen over the course of the next three years if we're going to be shifting to a new provider at the last minute or the drop of a hat has that stuff been rectified on their end but our financials back up to speed what types of protections do we have to sort of audit that yeah we we, we will never have 100 percent assuredness that they will be financially viable, nor will we with any company, frankly, but um, they have expanded and I've, we even were a reference for another school district they're looking to bring on um, down the road from us, and so we feel more comfortable with their financial viability, but they are a very small business, so there's risk. There's no way to mitigate that. In my opinion, um, going with another company that's much larger, but is Thirty to forty dollars more per day per vehicle. It's probably. I think it's an acceptable level of risk. Thank you. Beth. Uh, I'm going to withdraw my question. Okay. I'll just make one statement. Sure. Our our hiring them reduces our risk. Okay. If we have stable employee, okay. stable employment helps reduce our own risk. So, it, yep. Yeah, that's it. Bob and Howard. Yep. 
Bob? Just a question on the fuel, $4 a gallon. I understand it's a kind of a high end right now, gas and oil prices are about 50 below them. I'm sure we can't say money, but maybe uh, over a little and some other things no. to, and I don't, you know, $4 a gallon. Yeah, where I'm trying to find that report. You know the contract better than I do. So, thank you. Yeah. So, we're only on the hook if it goes above four dollars per gallon. Right. I'm just looking to see. Well, we're not paying for their gas. They they pay for it, but for it's a caveat. Yeah, it's it's yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. It protects their downside risk, but it, it we don't have anything to gain by asking for something lower. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I'll pay a carrier the full rate per bus for scheduled routes on days when school is canceled. Do we do that now with the big buses? Do we pay for buses that do not run? Um, I think that's only if you don't cancel within a certain time. And right? to piggyback on that with Howard, there's a clause in there for 5 o'clock in the morning. Are we making that decision prior to 5? Usually. Okay. That's usually my drop-dead date, but not always. Okay. Um, but I feel more motivation now, <laughs> <laughs> becoming more familiar with this contract. Um, well, it also says that it, we get it back if they have to make up snow days that we trade off. The next Does the next sentence clarify it? Yeah. In the event of cancellation? Quarter. We have five days. Would you go over there? We right there. can't the school for five days, and they get paid for those five days. Why? Why yeah. We well, we get if you read the last sentence, if the if the in the event of cancellation for inclement weather, district shall receive a credit for amounts paid to the carrier for the canceled day if the day is made up at the conclusion of the school year. But what they indicated to two things that they said to us. First is when they put a, a bus on the road or a van on the road and they show up at a kid's house and the kid's not going to go to school that day. Well, now they've paid gas and for the driver and all. So we're on the hook for that. You know, and that makes sense to me. The other thing is if we cancel school after the time which they negotiated at 5 a.m. and they put all their drivers on the road, then they're on the hook for that. We're on the hook for that as well. So that was But this states that we pay for it no matter what. We pay, the Even district shall pay the carrier full rate per bus for scheduled routes on days when school is canceled. So if we cancel school, we're paying them for, for setting idle. Yeah. Do we do that with for five days? Big buses. But uh, I think, uh, Howard, I think at the end of the, as, as was said, if we cancel with no school tomorrow, we have to make that, we make those days up at, at a certain point. So, and they don't charge us extra for those. Those those days are, are if you will, credited. But we don't. We have five days built in. We've only done two. So in, during that five-day window, we're, paying we're five still days. paying them. So though, we'll clarify this. And we yes. understand what how it should be. But I, I agree that it... it it says on one hand that if we cancel before five, we don't pay, but then it says we pay on every day it's canceled. Yeah. Yeah. It, it can't be both. Right. right. We, yeah. get we'll that clear, we, we will make yeah. that clear. If you okay. make the call after five, then. But if we cancel the night before Okay. Any other questions? Hey. Um, oh, sure. Sorry, Bob. Is there a uh, time pressure to adopt uh, this? Yes. The, the <laughs> <laughs> okay. This this has been a very long road. I, I know uh, I can fill you in later on some of the writings. So how do we address the issue <coughs> because we need to clarify? We'll we'll resolve that. Understand that we'll resolve that to I understand the board's position on that. And my my position is if schools canceled before five, we don't pay them, period. 
So we need to clarify that. So we'll do that. Okay. So do we need to... That was one of the issues I can just add. That it had been difficult in the last contract, and one of the arguing points was that they would go to a home, especially on days where Judge Chow wouldn't be there, and then in that contract they weren't paid. And they still have to pay their people, you know, five days a week for the runs and all that stuff. Yes, there's a little saving in the gas if the bus doesn't run at all, but in many cases, <coughs> they were just going to the house and there was nobody there. So that was why they went. Similar to the fact that if a bus goes down the road to pick up a child, you know, a big bus, if they're not there, um, we're still going to... Right, and we don't get a reimbursement from the disc... Yeah, right, exactly. We'll work that out. Okay. All right, so we do need a motion, um, and perhaps who make whoever makes the motion should clarify that um, based on the conversation that we've had at the board meeting regarding um, cancel days. the cancel days that we approve based on the resolution of that issue. So we'll make a motion to um, approve the contract with carrying hands um, pending clarification around um, school cancellation and payment. Is there a second? Howard, any further discussion? Questions? All those in favor? Do, uh, I, I'm sorry, sorry. I get to clear my throat. It's going to take a long time. Do, do we need in the motion that, 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 that what to recognize what our desired outcome is? I mean, I don't think that you do, but if. if I just, can we state for the record, what is the, just, can we agree just for, that the desired outcome is that if we notify them before a certain time, 5 a.m., that school is canceled? We don't pay for that day. <clears throat> for that day, that's the idea, right? Yes. Yep. And we'll find language to support that idea. Yes. yes. Okay. Did you get that, Danae? Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So it was it was um, motioned and seconded. No further discussion. All those in favor? Motion passes. Thank you. Thanks, negotiating team. Yes. Thank you, Porter and Meg. Okay, um, that concludes our meeting. We do have a, uh, a brief non-public. Brief? What? Yeah. It says non-scheduled. It's going to be brief. It doesn't say non-scheduled. The original A3, agenda C and uh, Yeah, it's going to be brief. L. I guess that's L. All right, so. Um, Motion to enter non-public. Seconded. <coughs> Roll call. Yes. Yes. Kuzma, yes. Kaufman, yes. Manning, yes. Facey, yes. Assembly, yes. Glover, yes. Beam, yes. Ekov, yes. O'Keefe, yes. Oh, we don't need you. No. Top. Yeah. 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 Yeah.